Hey friends, Matt here. Welcome to Learn to Discern. In today's video, we're going to be assessing some of the teaching of Stephen Furtick, Senior Pastor of Elevation Church in North Carolina. We're going to look at three clips taken from a message he recently did entitled Ford Not Finished. After each of those clips, we'll come back, we'll open up our Bible, and we will compare Stephen Furtick's teaching to the Word of God. But first, if you'd like to help promote Christian content on YouTube and get this out to more people on the internet, go ahead and take a second now to subscribe to my channel and thank you in advance. All right, I've explained the format, so let's go ahead and jump into our first clip. But watch what the Bible says, and this is kind of sad. He was 120 when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. And see, we kind of want to shout on that, but think about it. It's really sad. It's not something to shout about. It's something to cry about, because it means there was still more in him. Somebody say, there's more in me. Tell your neighbor. They don't believe it when they hear themselves say it. Maybe they'll believe you. Say, there's more in you. There's yeah, there's more in you. There's more in you. There's more in you. There's more in you. Now say it again. There's more in me. Praise the Lord. So let me start by saying that, yes, I am going to be critical of much of Stephen Furtick's teaching today, but I think it's important that we don't equate critical with mean. You see, the Bible tells us that we are supposed to test all Christian teaching, and it's pretty straightforward. If it's good teaching, we should listen to it and we should follow it, and if it's not, then we should reject it. So my contention is that there are many times during this sermon when Stephen Furtick is not correctly handling God's Word. So that doesn't mean we have to hate Stephen Furtick or throw him under a bus, but I do think it means that he is proving that he is not rightly handling God's Word and therefore we should not listen to his teaching. But let me prove that using God's Word. So as you can see, he was in the book of Deuteronomy, and if you remember the biblical narrative up till this point, Moses has been leading the people of Israel, the people of God, uh, yet there is a time of disobedience for Moses. God tells him to speak to the rock, and he strikes it instead, and because of that, God tells Moses that you will get to see the promised land, but you're not going to enter in. Joshua is going to be the leader that's going to take the people in, and so that is where Stephen Furtick is is picking up the narrative, and he seems to really be drawing attention to the fact that when Moses died, he was still strong, and he still had a lot left in him, and so he ties that to us and says that there's more in us. Friends, we always need to remember in the Bible, there are prescriptive passages and there are descriptive passages. This is a descriptive passage. It was describing what took place with Moses. This is not a prescription to say that all of us have more left in us and somehow we, we have to find that more and we're going to be able to use it. In fact, I can point you, just to show you that this is what is taking place, I can point you to two passages of scripture very quickly where we see that these biblical characters are not filled with great strength and vigor towards the end of their life. So one would be uh, Genesis chapter 27 with Isaac. It says, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. So we see that Isaac, when he is very old, he, he can't see very well. He doesn't have a lot of strength. We get to the book of first Kings chapter one, verse one. It says, now King David was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. So he was having a difficult time staying warm in his old age. So we see that this is not some sort of prescription that there's more left in all of us. And uh, it's, you know, it's really ends up just being this super encouraging message. And I think that's why Stephen Furtick focuses on that one. He doesn't, he's not going to go to the story of Isaac or to the story of uh, David. He, he's going to go to this one because it sounds really good. And friends, think about it even further, right? If, if the story from Deuteronomy did have application to our life, wouldn't the correct application be that there's more in you, but you're going to die? before you tap into it. That's exactly what happened with Moses, right? He died before he could tap into the more that he supposedly had. Friends, this is not the point that is being made in that passage, but this is uh, just an example of somewhat narcissistic teaching where you, you take books of the Bible, stories of the Bible, and you turn it and make it all about us when that passage is not about there being more within us. So Stephen Furtick is not off to a great start. Unfortunately, I think it's going to get much worse from here. So let's go ahead and jump into our second clip. Now, Joshua. 
I need that B3 shot. Now, Joshua. No more Moses. Did you look for him up there? Yeah, I looked up there. No Mo. I looked for him over here. No Mo. I went back. I texted him. No Mo. I went back. I tried to ask him to have me back. No Mo. But for every no Mo in your life, there is a now Joshua that God has been developing. Hey! took my Deuteronomy pill this morning, y'all. Woo! Now Joshua, look at this verse, this is anointed. Now Joshua, son of Nun. I gotta do it, I gotta do it. Where you see Nun, God says now. Okay, to provide a little context, Right before that clip, Stephen Furtick had been talking about the people of Israel after Moses died, and he said that the Israelites were spending this time searching for Moses even though he was no more. Now, I would point out that the text of the Bible does not say that the people of Israel were looking for Moses as if he was still around, so I think he's inserting that into the text, but he uses that as a background to say that whatever you've been looking for in your life that is no more God is developing a Joshua for you. Friends, again, is this the point of Deuteronomy chapter 34, that whatever we've been looking for that is no more, God is developing a Joshua? This is a very self-centered and narcissistic way to look at the Bible, to think that everything is about me and my life and that every detail of these really positive stories somehow means that something positive is going to happen for me in my life. Stephen Furtick is not correctly handling this biblical passage. And friends, there is something called authorial intent. What was the intent of the author who wrote it? And in one sense, we could say that all of scripture is God-breathed. So God is the author of all all of the Bible. Do we think that was his intent in writing the book of Deuteronomy so that we would say, hey, whatever it is that I've been looking for and I can't find, God's going to raise up a Joshua for me. Friends, this is not even remotely close to how we should handle the Bible. Now, we also saw that he got very hyped up and very energetic during that uh, section. And friends, this to me is somewhat manipulative. And I am not saying that um, Stephen Furtick's intention is to manipulate people. I don't know Stephen Furtick's heart, and it's not appropriate for me to speak about his intentions. But I can say that it is a byproduct of what will take place. When you have the music going like that, and you're screaming, and it gets very emotional, people are inclined to just buy into whatever you are saying. And so people think that what is being said is is really, really good and really profound and really deep when in reality what they are being told is not even remotely close to a faithful handling of the biblical text. Now I have to get to the part that to me was the most ridiculous. So he talked about Joshua, son of Nun, and he said, where you see Nun, God says now. Friends, I hope I don't have to tell you that the fact that somebody's name in the Hebrew language was Nun has nothing to do with our English word, none, which is not even spelled the same way. I mean, the Bible wasn't written in English, so it is completely absurd to make some sort of correlation there. Plus, bonus fact for you, if you were actually pronouncing it in the Hebrew, it's not pronounced none, it's pronounced noon, and its meaning is fish. So the, the parallel doesn't work on any level. But once again, this is an opportunity for Stephen Furtick to take this detail. I mean, like, what is the point of that? The point is that Joshua's dad was named Nun, right? That's the point. He takes it and says, oh, this is an opportunity for me to preach something that sounds really good. And so he says, you see Nun, but God says now. Friends, that's a false promise. How is somebody supposed to take that? I mean, if you're listening to what he says, it certainly seems like what he is saying is that whatever you've been wanting to happen in your life that you're not seeing take place, and it's it's none right now, God's about to do it right now. I mean, it seems like without using these exact words, he is saying God is about to deliver a miracle for you. Whatever it is that you want, it's going to happen. 
Friends, I absolutely believe God is a miracle-working God. He can work miracles, but it is horrifically wrong to tell people that God is going to work a miracle definitively in whatever way that you want for it to take place. So this is such a narcissistic and self-centered way to preach the Bible, and it's tickling people's ears. It's taking very obscure details and making them seem like they are big promises for our life, but it's just looking for the positive thing. So this is a, a mangling of this text so far. We do have one more clip to get to. Let's go ahead and check it out. He was God of a nation when he only had one man named Abraham. And I promise you everything under Abraham's hood was not working right. And even if it was, Sarah's womb was dead, so he had no chance, but God did it because he's a generational God. He's a generational God in the sense that what he started in the beginning with Adam, he recreated in Christ, who is the second Adam. Because we could not do it by the works of the law, so God took that book that stood against us, put it on Jesus, who knew no sin. Can I preach the gospel for 10 seconds? And he made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So don't ever say this little church phrase, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You ain't just nothing but somebody that Jesus thought was worth dying for. All right, friends, let me start with the positives of that last clip, just so you know that I actually am assessing everything that is being said, and if something's good, I will definitely acknowledge it. So Jesus is indeed the second Adam who came perfectly lived out the law and offered himself as a sacrifice on behalf of us. And so now through faith in his work, we can become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. So I am 100% happy that he got that part correct. But even in getting that correct, what he said was still very much tainted because there towards the end, he said, you've heard people say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And he says, no, that's incorrect. You are not a sinner saved by grace. In fact, you are somebody who was worth it. God saw that you were worth the sacrifice of his son, of Jesus. Friends, let me be clear. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says that God demonstrated his love for us by sending his son to the cross. But was the reason that Jesus was sent because I am of such great value and because I am worthy? The answer is no. The reason that Jesus was sent is because I am a sinner and he is the only one who was able to deal with that problem. I mean, just think about it in your life. How weird would it be if you wanted to demonstrate your love for a relative or, you know, maybe you like have a fiance or something. You're like, I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm going to go and kill my only son. That makes no sense. The reason that Jesus came and died is because he was the only one who could atone for our sins. But in that, as I already said, it absolutely demonstrates his love and the fact that he was willing to go through with it. But when you tell people you were worthy of it, friends, that's saying that we're worthy of the shed blood of Christ. That is absolutely not correct. I thank God that he was um, loving enough and merciful enough to send Jesus, but it was not because I was worthy. Friends, as we know, we are saved by grace through faith. The word grace literally means unmerited favor. It means you don't deserve it. So if you say you're worth it, then it's not grace because if you're worth it, then you deserve it. We don't deserve it because we're not worth it. I would also like to point out in scripture where the apostle Paul, I mean, I hope you don't think of yourself as, um, as spiritual or as Christianly and godly as the Apostle Paul. I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul had to say about himself. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. It says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Did you notice the tense? Not of whom I was the foremost. I am the foremost. Friends, we absolutely are sinners saved by grace. And this really just wraps up what I've been saying throughout my assessment of this teaching. So much of what Stephen Furtick says is just very narcissistic. It's very self-centered. It hypes us up to be the heroes, to be the champions. There's more in us. We're going to tap into our potential. God's going to do great things on our behalf. And certainly there are nuggets of truth within some of those things in terms of 
God still works today and God can do great things, but he's always skewing it just enough to, to get us off track. I'd also like to point out that Stephen Furtick, Furtick, excuse me, does absolutely say some things that are correct. Um, it's not like everything that he says is totally wrong. And I want to acknowledge that because maybe some people think that uh, when someone like myself gets on here and tries to do an assessment of this, it's like, we think this guy doesn't ever say anything right. No, I think there's a decent amount of things that he says that are correct, but he has plenty enough of this bad stuff to really taint the whole message. And just think about it, friends. Why would you want to go somewhere or listen to somebody who maybe 60% of the time, and I'm just making that number up, okay? 60% of the time, they are faithful to the biblical text. When you could go listen to somebody who's going to do it 100% of the time. Stephen Furtick does not faithfully handle the text uh, routinely. And so I think this is someone that we need to avoid in terms of listening to his teaching, because it's going to be really hard to distinguish between the good and bad. Some people say, eat the meat, spit out the bones. Friends, why don't you just go to someone who's going to serve you meat with no bones in it? That's what we should be doing in the first place. So definitely don't recommend that we listen to Stephen Furtick's teaching. All right, friends, that's all I have for you. I hope this is helpful in your walk with the Lord. Let's pray for Stephen Furtick. I'm not saying that he's not a believer, friends. I don't know that, but I want to pray for him regardless that he would grow in knowledge of the Lord. And I hope that we take this information not just so that we can speak badly of other people, but that it helps us to better understand the Bible and that we can assess when people are teaching to us and we know, should I listen to this or should I not? So that's really my goal in all of it. If this has been helpful to you today, again, if you would please consider subscribing to the channel, I really appreciate it. And it will help me to get this content out to more people here on YouTube. That's all I have for you guys today. Thanks so much for watching. And until next time, God bless.